Son of God Hung on a cross to
Amen. We should just do that every Sunday. How's everybody doing? Happy Easter. My heart rate is 150 beats a minute right now. And it will be a miracle if I, if I survive two of these. Um, I, got a, um, I got a message for you today that's going to hopefully, it's aimed at the mind and at the heart because I think both need to encounter the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in order for it to really begin to powerfully change and transform our lives. But before I get to this message, we have decided to do something that we've never done, to my knowledge, at least we've never done it on an Easter morning before. The vision for our church when, when we study Scripture, we feel like the church exists for one reason, that's to see lives transformed by Jesus. And so on, on a day like Easter, the day that we, that's given to specifically celebrate uh, the event that makes life change possible, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we wanted to put life change on display so I'm going to be back up here in just a minute or two, but, but um, before I get to my message, we've asked three people uh, to share their personal testimonies about how Jesus not only has changed, but is continuing to change them. Um, so I, I uh, just ask you to lean in, uh, because I think this is going to be amazing, and uh, I haven't heard these before, so I'm, I'm one of you this morning. Can we come on up? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Mark, and I'm so excited to be here with you this morning. This is just uh, an amazing opportunity to share with you a little bit about what Jesus has done in my life. And it's, uh, and it's crazy because when I was a kid, I, I never would have thought I'd be in a position like this. And when I was little, we kind of, we went to church sometimes. And I definitely heard about Jesus and, and, uh, and about the good news, but I guess I sort of felt like a relationship with Jesus wasn't something for people like me. When I was a kid, uh, you can ask my mom, she's here. I was a terrible kid. <laughs> I was such a bad kid, and I was always getting in fights and getting in trouble, doing things I wasn't supposed to do. And uh, by the time I was a teenager, uh, it was worse. My life really spiraled out of control, and I was just partying, doing drugs, drinking, getting all sorts of trouble. and. Um, by the time I was 18, I'd gotten involved in a robbery, and I'd gotten arrested, and uh, I was 18 years old in Maryland State Prison, and I felt like my life was just over, and everything I put my hope in, all the promises that I believed would make me happy, it was just a lie, and I knew I needed more than just a couple of life hacks, a couple of tips and tricks to get back on track. I needed a whole new life, and I didn't know how to get it. And uh, I was in the slammer, and people told me about different religions and different ways of life, and nothing seemed to satisfy my heart and my mind at the same time. And uh, somebody told me about Jesus again, and I felt like it made sense of history and made sense of the world around me and, and made sense of what I knew about my heart. But I thought back to when I was a kid and how I didn't think Jesus could be for me. Could Jesus really forgive me after all the terrible, terrible things I'd done? all the people I'd hurt, and um, I just didn't know. And one day, I felt like God spoke to me so clearly through the Bible. Um, I was reading the book of Acts, chapter 2. There's this guy named Peter, and right after the very first Easter, Peter stands up in front of this huge crowd in Jerusalem, and he says, he's basically like, you are the people who literally killed Jesus. But he's like, he's like but it's not too late for you. He says, repent and believe and be baptized, and you can be saved too. And that, that word came to me with such supernatural power. It just, I felt like there was a light switch that went off, and if God could forgive the people who literally killed Jesus, he could forgive me too. And uh, so I put my faith in Jesus, and I tell you, it changed everything about me. I didn't want to do bad stuff anymore, and I wanted to do the right thing and help people. And... Um, and there's been, you know, ups and downs. I've still made so many mistakes after that day. But Jesus has been with me so faithfully and, uh, and just leading me to share this hope that I found that nobody's too far from the love of God. Nobody. And uh, so now I get to be here rejoicing with you all and uh, rejoicing with my wife. She's getting baptized at the end of service today. 
And uh, I'm just so thankful. Thank you. I'm James. I said yes to Dave about this before I really thought about standing in front of a lot of people. So <laughs> walk through this with me as I forget every other word. That was awesome to hear Mark's testimony. Um, I'm kind of the exact opposite, to be honest. I grew up in the church. Um, I have what I would describe as a boring testimony, but somebody gave me some advice that it's probably the type of testimony that a lot of people in church need to hear. Um, so I remember at a, a pretty conservative Baptist church growing up at five, being like, terrified of hell after uh, a sermon and raising my hand with my, my head bowed, walking to the back, praying the sinner's prayer. And then naturally after that, of course, I spent the next 10 or 12 years just being terrified of death every night going to sleep. I would lay down, close my eyes, and just pray every night that God would save me so that I, I didn't die and go to hell. Um, and I couldn't carry that, that burden anymore. Uh, by the time I got to high school, um, I remember breaking down with this college-age guy who had come and visited. It was actually on my birthday, um, a Sunday, and I just had a heart-to-heart, a, -heart, a raw moment with God, crying in front of this guy I had never met, classic high school guy move, right? Um, and... I suddenly felt free. I didn't know what had happened before that, but I knew after that I was secure in, in Christ's sacrifice and that it wasn't dependent on how much faith I had in him, but in, in the sacrifice that, that he had for me. And I could depend on that even in days where I have doubts or even in days where I don't trust myself. And I mean, he, that's when he started to slowly chip away and transform my life through college. And I just, I just started to develop a love for people, which is uh, it's just been life-changing for me. I, I love people because Christ loves people. I want them to know the truth. I want them to know that I care about them and because Christ cares about them. And the other burden that I started carrying about the same time was after getting baptized when I was five years old, after this new renewal, I felt like, oh, I should probably get baptized again. And it's been seven or eight years since then, which I'm 24, so that's a big portion of my life. Um, and I've seen a lot of baptisms being in church ever since with the lingering thought, oh, I should get baptized, I should get baptized. Even sometimes just driving to work, I should get baptized again. But always afraid of what other people would think. Oh, what are they going to think? I, I was just never saved. They're seeing me get baptized again. And then it occurred to me one day that uh, I was confining myself to the same fears that I had when I was younger, afraid of dying, well, now I'm just confining myself to the, to, the, to, the, to the fear of what others might think by my outward demonstration. Um, and so it's the exact same mistake, and I was just ready to incline my ear to the Holy Spirit again. I'm ready to live it and make the decision again to live in the freedom of Christ's sacrifice. And uh, when Dave talked to me about doing this, I was like, well, if this, that's not a perfect opportunity to uh, actually get baptized after thinking about that for long enough, I don't know what is. And so it's probably a little bit of surprise to some of the, the baptism planners here at Severn because I didn't actually sign up, but uh, I guess you'll have to make room for me in that tank. And murmurs, I think whispers got around. My name still appears in red in the list that, uh, of baptisms, so they're so good at planning, they figured it out somehow, but weren't too sure, so they didn't put me down in black. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to do it, and I'm excited for the changes the Lord has made in my life. I don't memorize anything, so mind the papers. Um, so I'm just going to like start right off because all the fears and coming after those two gentlemen, um, that's all kind of included in here. Um, when I was 18, I ended up in a hospital for three days, and I've battled depression and anxiety since I can remember, um, but I was given the opportunity to heal, and so I took that opportunity, um, and like I said, I was in the hospital for three days. I remember being on a payphone with my father then, um, again, 18, sorry, I'm so shaky. Um, he invited me to church for the first time. And we had attended church before, kind of like um, 
Mark has said here and there, but we were never in a church community. Um, is it okay if I stand up on the stage? Because I can't even read my own shaking hands. Um, but we never like belonged to the community. So I said no thank you, and um, instead I really, uh, I took control of my own life and took agency and I started taking medications and I started going to counseling and therapists and um, really like just took control. Um, I started traveling, making things, doing things that would be, um, make me happy in a moment and what I thought would make me happy over, overall. Uh, my parents who, we were never, I'd been tested as a kid, um, but we were, they were very anti-pharmaceutical. Uh, so at that time, I, like I said, I started medications and they were very supportive of everything I was doing. Um, but like things under my control, I took what was supposed to be an aid for me and I turned it into a dependency. Um, so when I was 28, I made a decision to go pharma free again, similar to what my par parents had always raised me as. And it took close to a year, but I did it. I did it on my own. Um, I was getting healthier, I was doing it under my own accord, uh, but I still just couldn't shake that depression and anxiety. I would still drive down the road thinking of all these worst case scenarios and letting myself go into them. Um, and so at that time, 28, I had quit the medical field. I had been working, uh, following my grandmother's footsteps to be an RN, and I had worked in all these different aspects of the medical field. And I left and I went to work at a restaurant um, I worked 20 to 30 hours a week. I traveled a bunch. I did, I've done two week road trips with my grandmother. Uh, I think the year I started dating my husband, we took like eight vacations together. It was really great and it was momentary happiness. Um, and that's where I was. I was working at a restaurant when a young man walked in and uh, the restaurant was basically closing. He worked at the, or he was attending the Naval Academy and we talked for hours as the restaurant was closing, hours just about God and faith and um, just life, really. And he never, he never told me what to believe or even um, how to believe. He just was a nice guy. And um, so you take this young man, you had my sister, who had known the Lord by then. I was 28, so she had probably known him about 10 years she had been saved. And uh, who would always pray for my closed-off heart and told me so. Um, my friend who knew exactly and would tell me who I needed. Um, and I had this co-worker, uh, Christina. She was just this, just so joyous in the Lord. Um, and you take all four of those people, and then you add my father, so five. And whether it was just a night of conversation or just years of unrelenting love, um, that would lead me to raise my hand in a North Carolina church while visiting my sister who moved there. Um, I said, God, all right, well, I've surely tried over my past, now at this point, 30 years, 30 plus years, uh, to heal myself and save myself. That's what I wanted. I wanted to be healed and I wanted to be saved. Um, but I said, let's, let's see what you can do. Um, I went back to work after visiting my sister that next week, picked up an extra shift uh, to make up for the time I'd lost visiting. And uh, we won't go into the whole story, but I got demoted uh, right like that. And um, what the point you need to know is um, is how I dealt with it, and honestly, I can say I, I didn't deal with it at all. God had already fully given me his spirit in that moment when I raised my hand. He knew my heart, and he knew I was trusting him, even though I felt like it was a test. Um, he knew it was trust, and he, he dealt with all of it. He gave me his wisdom before I even cracked a spine of a Bible. He gave me... Um, he gave me his spirit, and he, he just fully gave me his wisdom. Um, so after a couple months of learning about God and really 
uh, just leaning into him and reading the Bible and reading his word and being in his community of people, you all, I mean, you all, um, I just, I had, sorry, being in his community, I had, uh, it was just so clear that every step that I made in those last couple months working at that restaurant, um, it was his control. It was through him that I was able to do it. So he gave me the strength, and Lord, I thank you for that. And similar on how I can look back over my youth and see times where I would be called overreacting um, and see them for what they were, which was panic or anxiety attacks um, as a small child. I can see back now to my youth and see how all these different ways God was just trying to get me and show me who he was. I had my father who had a humble invite, my sister a faithful prayer, a friend and now husband, a patient truth, truth teller, um, my coworker, a joyous daughter, and my customer, a conversation. God worked through so many people so I could know him. And that's why when I was invited to share my testimony, in spite of knowing I have stage fright and I don't like talking in front of big crowds, um, I said yes and I didn't hesitate because a friend of mine who um, recently moved away, Melissa, she uh, has had a really hard time with it. And um, she got to share her testimony not too long ago. And to quote her, uh, she said, I believe we have isolated the reason why I am here. God had moved her because he was working through her, and there were people there that needed to hear her story. So I came up here, and I just wanted to share what I could of mine. And so after hearing that, of course I had to say yes to this. Um, I just wanted to finish off with saying that depression and anxiety have made sense to me this way. Depression is being overwhelmed by your past, and anxiety is being overwhelmed by the future, um, but now as a child of God and by his grace, he, I've surrendered. You can surrender your past to him. And I have, he also owns all of my tomorrows. Um, God has given me now and God has given me and gives all of us eternity. Thank you. Amen. Meg, for what it's worth, I have stage fright too, so no judgment from me. Um, that's the first time we've, we've ever done something like that. I'm already uh, really, really glad that we did. And of all the things that I could point out about what you just heard, I, I hope uh, what just became clear, especially for those of you that might be new to all this, is that there really is no such thing as a Christian type. There, there's no such thing as the kind of person that Jesus saves, the kind of person that Jesus makes sense to, because what you just heard from of course, this would be more clear if you heard from 30 or 300 Christians, but that's just three people with wildly different backgrounds, wildly different childhoods, wildly different um, experiences. But the one thing that they, have, they, they all have in common, and this is amazing to me, because those are three people that probably would have never had a conversation with each other this side of eternity, uh, but those are three people that now refer to each other as brother and sister simply because they have all had their lives transformed by Jesus. The question I want to put before you today is how do you explain that? And the, the, the Christian answer to that, to how three people with such wildly different stories could all have this one thing in common that they've met and been transformed by Jesus, the Christian answer to how that's possible is the event that we celebrate every Easter, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what I want to spend some time talking about. So in our culture, <clears throat> sometimes referred to as the... Uh, the speaker's kind of pinching me. I like to shuffle a little bit when I'm up here. I can't do it now. I'm frozen. Um, maybe I'll hop in the tank and preach a few bars for you. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the modern secular West that you and I live in, which is highly uh, skeptical about anything that, ha that has to do with miracles or the supernatural or anything like that, it's become increasingly common for people to view the resurrection not as a literal, physical event that actually took place in history, but more as a, as a metaphor. For instance... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, my family and I went to D.C. for the Cherry Blossom Festival. 
And uh, if, you, if you've ever been down there, if you know anything about, about cherry blossoms, they're really beautiful when they bloom, but it's a very short-lived bloom. It's, it's maybe two weeks, if you're lucky, if a storm doesn't come and knock them all off. And so during that time, hundreds of thousands of people get into D.C. and walk around the Tidal Basin. And um, cherry blossoms are, are a, um, apparently a source of inspiration for a lot of people. You can look this up. They represent renewal. They represent optimism, kind of this idea that, uh, you know, beauty always follows apparent deadness because spring always follows the winter, and it's become increasingly common for people to view the resurrection of Jesus Christ through the same lens, that, of course, you can't actually believe that a dead Jewish carpenter came back to life because he was God. It's just a metaphor, you know, because life is full of crucifixions, you know, setbacks and dead ends and and closed doors, but if you just kind of hang on, it'll, it'll lead to resurrections, you know, new beginnings and new opportunities and You know, it's like Alfred famously told the young Bruce Wayne in the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy, why do we fall so we can learn to pick ourselves up? I just want to point this out. A message like that would have never had the impact on the world that Christianity has had because a message like that does not have the power to help anybody who's experiencing real suffering. Uh, A message like that does nothing for a widow who's grieving the loss of her husband, wondering what the rest of her life's going to look like. Uh, That message cannot help an abuse survivor who feels like their childhood's been stolen from them. Can't help a parent who's lost a child, and it certainly cannot help somebody dealing with their own mortality when they hear that they only have months to live. And I'll tell you that regardless of what you believe today, it is a plain fact of history that Christians were the most persecuted people group for the first three centuries in the Roman Empire. They experienced unfair treatment, imprisonment, persecution. They were tortured. They were murdered in all kinds of inhuman ways, but... They were transformed by the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the midst of their suffering until eventually that entire Roman Empire was, was transformed by the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And since then, that message has gone into every nation, tribe, and tongue. It's transformed the lives of countless men and women, including the people that you heard from just moments ago. The reason for that is because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not a metaphor. It's not a symbol. It's a literal, physical event that took place in history, and it has the power to change your life. What I'd like to do today is read you Matthew's account of the resurrection of Jesus. We're in Matthew chapter 28. I'll read this quickly, but I want to read the whole chapter to you. It says, After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his robe was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken from fear of him that they became like dead men. But the angel told the women, don't be afraid, because I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has been resurrected just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there. Listen, I've told you. So departing quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the news. Just then, Jesus met them and said, good morning. (laughs) They came up, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus told them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. As they were on their way, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders and agreed on a plan, They gave the soldiers a large sum of money and told them, say this, his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were sleeping. If this reaches the governor's ears, we'll deal with him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been spread among Jewish people to this day. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Then Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. This is God's word. Now, I said before I read this that the resurrection of Jesus Christ has the power to change your life. In order for that to happen, there's really two questions that you have to wrestle with in light of what you've just heard. These two questions are going to frame uh, the talk this morning. Uh, The first is, what sense does the resurrection make? The second is, what difference does it make? I want to begin by asking the question, what sense 
does the resurrection of Jesus Christ make? In a culture that's as, as skeptical about miracles as ours is, uh, I feel like if you don't address the intellectual obstacles that modern people have with this account, you know, you're, you're wasting your time. So what I want to do for kind of the first half of this message is offer you three reasons that it is very difficult to dismiss the literal, physical, historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. The reasons are, number one, the timing is too early. Number two, the content is too counterproductive. And number three, the transformation is too radical. So let let me walk through kind of these three um, defenses for the resurrection. First off, the timing's too early. One really common objection uh, to Christianity in general has to do with the timing of the the writing of the accounts of Jesus' life. A lot of people, if asked who Jesus is, will say something along these lines. Jesus Jesus was a good man. You know, but over time, his followers, maybe meaning well, embellished about his life. They started to say maybe he was more than a man. Miracle stories got attached to his name. They started to say, well, maybe he wasn't crucified. Maybe he actually died for the sins of the world, you know, and, and maybe he came back to life. And over centuries of the legends evolving, they got written down. They became what we now refer to as the New Testament. And that's how you have Christianity. Uh, that's a very common um, concept, per- per- perception, rather, of Christianity. That's sort of mixture of what you'll get from Religion 101, Philosophy 101, and the Da Vinci Code. The only problem with that account of Christianity is that every single aspect of it is utterly and entirely wrong. So let's, let's start here. The, the New Testament letters written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Paul primarily Uh, can't be considered legends. When we talk about a legend, we're talking about an account that's written so long after the events it describes that no one can reasonably either credit or discredit the account. That's what a legend is defined as. The New Testament letters simply aren't like that. Uh, They were written within the lifetimes of the people that were there, and you even see that in this account. For instance, verse 15, it says, So they took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been spread among Jewish people to this day. Right. Matthew is writing so soon after the events he describes here that he could still talk about the fact that this particular story was still in circulation. That's because Matthew, you may be surprised to hear, was writing not 300 years after the resurrection, but just 30. And Paul, uh, who wrote about 13 books of the New Testament, was writing just 15 years after the resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he makes an insane claim if he was making this story up. He says in 1 Corinthians 15 that not only did Jesus Christ raise from the dead and visit numerous people, but on one occasion, the resurrected Jesus appeared to over 500 people at the same time. He says most of them are still alive, and you can go ask them if you don't believe me. Now, I don't have to tell you that's an insane claim to make if you're making up a religion. When you're making up a religion, you say something like, I've had a divine revelation that can't be proven or disproven, you just got to take my word for it. That's not what Paul is saying. That's not what any of the first followers of Jesus are saying. They're saying there's a whole lot of people that all claim they saw the same thing with their own two eyes. If you don't believe me, go ask them. That would be the equivalent. If Paul's writing 15 years after the resurrection, that would be the equivalent of me, we're in 2022, saying that I know a dead guy that came back to life in 2007. First off, how horrifying that 2007 is now 15 years behind us. Not the point of this teaching. However, this would be the equivalent of me saying, I know a dead guy that came back to life in 2007. He appeared to 500 people. They're still alive. If you want to prove me wrong, go talk to them and see if they don't confirm my claim. Right then and there, Christianity had every reason to die before it got started, and yet here we are today, 2,000 years later, still talking about this. So first off, the timing of the writing of the accounts makes it very difficult to dismiss the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. Secondly, the content is too counterproductive. Maybe you hear that and you say, okay, fine, it was written earlier than I thought, but the only reason that an account like this got off the ground is because people back then were gullible uh, and, and easy to mislead and, of course, prone to believing something like this actually happened. Again, let's take that idea into the text and see what we find here. In verses 16 and 17, it says, The eleven disciples traveled to Galilee, the mountain where Jesus had directed them. Verse 17, When they saw Jesus, Jesus who told them over and over and over again, I'm going to die, but I'm going to be back. He said, when they, it says, When they saw Jesus, they worshipped, 
but some doubted. Isn't that an interesting detail? That some of the, the, the hand-picked disciples Jesus spent three and a half years with, that he was preparing for this event, uh, Matthew's telling us here that, that, that even some of them doubted. I just want to ask you, if you were making this whole thing up, would you write that here? Would you include that detail? Would you say that some of the men that went on to be founders of the movement known as Christianity themselves doubted the resurrection even though they saw it with their own eyes? Of course you wouldn't say that. You'd say that these men were so stalwart in their belief that they set up camps outside the tomb because they just knew Jesus was going to come back. But this is exactly how it would be with real people. What I mean by that is if the risen Jesus appeared to you in your bedroom tonight, I don't think you'd explode in a chorus of there's a river of life flowing out of me. I think first off you'd be terrified, and if the fear ever subsided, you'd be rubbing your eyes and, and you know, what the heck is going on, and once Jesus disappeared, you would be second-guessing whether or not you actually saw him for the, probably the rest of your life. Was that real? Did I just really want to believe? That's any, any normal person would be like that. Any normal person would have doubts, and the point is these were normal people. But, but follow me here. The reason that they had doubts is not just that they're normal people, right? We modern people have this tendency to believe, you know, we know better than to believe in miracles because we have a scientific understanding of the world we live in. But, of course, ancient people were prone to believing pretty much anything you told them because they had a pre-scientific understanding of the world. And I'll, I'll say this to that claim. It is true that, if, of course it's true, that ancient people were more prone to believing in miracles than we are. However, these were first-century people and first century people, for first century people, the resurrection did not make any more sense to them when they heard it than it does to people living in the 21st century. Here's why. Uh, for, first off, for Greeks and Romans in, in the Roman Empire, <clears throat> Greeks and Romans believed that the body was bad because it's subject to decay and all these things, whereas the spirit or the soul is good. So in their um, worldview, if salvation existed at all, it entailed the soul or the spirit escaping from the body. So the idea of getting a physically resurrected body back wouldn't have even sounded good to them. It certainly wouldn't have made sense to them. So you wouldn't have made up a worldview like that to try to persuade a whole bunch of Greeks and, and, and Romans. You say, well, what about Jewish people? Well, it's true. Most Jewish people, though not all, we know that there were groups of Jews that believed in no afterlife like the Sadducees. Most Jewish people did believe in a general resurrection, here's the key point, at the end of history. But what absolutely nobody believed, what nobody believed is that one person could get their resurrected body in the middle of history and start walking around in the middle of a world that's still broken and stained and marred by sin. My point is, if you were, if you were making up a belief system with which you hope to mislead and deceive uh, first century people, you would never have come up with something like Christianity because it wouldn't have made sense to them. And you see this in Scripture. That's why when Paul is standing in Athens, the intellectual capital of the Roman Empire in Acts 17, he's talking about God. And everybody is leaning into what he says, and it all makes sense, and they're interested. But the moment that Paul starts talking about the resurrection, they laugh him out of the Oropagus. Even back then, they thought it sounded crazy. Same thing in Acts chapter 26, when Paul's on trial before Festus and Agrippa, he's, te he's giving his testimony, and he's talking about who he was before Jesus and how Jesus changed his life. Nobody had a problem with that. But the moment Paul mentioned the resurrection is when Festus cuts him off and says, Paul, you're out of your mind. Too much study is driving you mad. The point is, the Bible is, it itself is extremely clear that the resurrection didn't make any more sense to them than they heard it, than it does to modern people like us when we first hear it. And so here's the question. Let me just offer you this as a thought experiment. What, what kind of evidence would you need to blow away all your doubts about Christianity and get you to devote your life to it? I'll answer that question for you and go out on a limb and say, pretty strong evidence. You're not going to take this on just somebody's opinion or what somebody says. You would need to know there are really good reasons to believe this. Well, here's the thing. If first century people were just as skeptical as you and I are, just as prone to disbelieving the resurrection as you and I are, they went on to believe. And not just to devote their lives to it, but to suffer and be tortured and be killed rather than deny the resurrection of Jesus. What that means is they must have received evidence at least as strong as the kind of evidence that you and I would need. You know, say what you will about first century people. They were not gullible morons prone to believing the impossible because they had no problem exercising blind faith. 
They had every reason to discredit this story when they heard it, but they didn't. And the most plausible reason for that is because this story is true. But the third reason, the third reason that it's difficult to dismiss the physical, literal, historical resurrection of Jesus is that the transformation is too radical. <clears throat> to explain what I mean, look at verse 19 here. Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> That's a real famous verse in the Bible. Sometimes Christians call that the Great Commission. <clears throat> Let me just sit here for a second and explain exactly what's going on here. Jesus has just risen from the dead. None of his 11 disciples really stuck with him through his crucifixion and burial. None of them actually believed that he was going to come back from the dead, but here he is, he's resurrected. He's now staring at them. And he says, you 11 uneducated fishermen, I want you to go change the world with the message that a dead Jewish carpenter came back to life because it was God. You want to hear something crazy? They did. What I'm about to share with you is what I consider to be the strongest argument for the historical resurrection of Jesus. This, this train of thought has strengthened my faith really more than any other angle I could approach. That's why I wanted to save it for, for kind of the last, uh, the last offense here. Some of you may know this if you've done your own research. There were countless messianic movements in and around Israel in the decades before and after Jesus. When I say messianic movement, that's a movement where somebody starts talking about the fact that they are either God or sent by God and they're here to provide some kind of salvation or deliverance for people. There are countless messianic movements around the time of Jesus, either decades before or decades after, and every single messianic movement in history has four identifiable phases. Uh, let me just go ahead and prophesy here. If I ever start telling you all or anybody else that I'm, you know, divine, my messianic movement is going to have exactly four identifiable phases, although I'm betting they're going to be really short-lived. Here it is. Every messianic movement in history... The leader claims to be divine. Number two, the leader gets some group of people to believe their claim. Number three, the leader dies. And directly tied to number three, because when people die, they tend to do the same thing, which is stay dead. When they die, number four, the movement dies. See, when you claim... When you claim what Jesus claimed, Buddha didn't claim what Jesus claimed. Buddha didn't claim to save you he claimed to offer you a way of salvation that you could then walk in. Basically, he offered advice, the eightfold path. Muhammad did not claim to save you. He, did, he, he didn't claim to be Allah. He said, I'm Allah's mouthpiece. I'll tell you what to do if you want to get connected to Allah. And there you have the five pillars of Islam and all that kind of stuff. But when you say what Jesus said, Jesus didn't offer instruction primarily. He didn't offer advice primarily. He offered himself. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. When you present yourself as the Messiah... When you present yourself as divine and you tell people, don't put your hope in my words, put your hope in me, then when you die, your movement dies with you. That's the way every messianic movement in history has gone. There's exactly one exception to that rule. There is exactly one belief system that has inexplicably managed to survive the death of its founder. That movement is what we now refer to today as Christianity. Christianity not only did not die with its founder, but it exploded after the death of its founder as thousands of Jewish and Greek people went on to believe this crazy astounding story that a dead Jewish carpenter came back to life because he was God to the point that in the year 380, the Roman emperor Theodosius declared Christianity the official belief system of the Roman Empire. Stand back from that and imagine. Rome went from murdering Jesus to publicly declaring that Jesus is the truth, and he is exclusively the truth. That took place in about 350 years, and I'll tell you, no historian has been able to offer a satisfactory explanation of how that happened apart from the resurrection of Jesus. So here's what all of this means for you and I today. You can say, as a modern, skeptical, secular person, I'm sorry, I just can't believe in the resurrection. But if that's where you're coming from, then let me just say, if, if you want to operate with any intellectual integrity and you say, I, I'm, I just can't believe in the resurrection, well, then, then now it's on you, and I, I mean this respectfully, but now it's on you to account for why hundreds of Jewish people all claim to have saw him, even though professing that they did got them tortured and murdered. 
And now you have to account for why thousands of Jewish and Greek people whose worldviews made no room for a resurrected Messiah changed their minds seemingly overnight and devoted their entire lives to this belief system that was unlike anything that anybody had ever heard of. And you need to account for why the most persecuted group of people for the first three centuries somehow managed to transform the greatest dynasty in human history completely without the use of force. In other words, you need to come up with a historically plausible alternate explanation for the birth of the Christian church. And I'll tell you, it becomes increasingly difficult to do so with any intellectual integrity if you will not accept the fact that Jesus Christ was literally, physically, historically raised from the dead. And here we are 2,000 years later, and every year, billions, with a B, billions of people are still celebrating the birth, life, death, resurrection of the one founder of a major belief system who claims something none of the other founders claimed, which is not that he was here to help you find God, but that he was God, and he's come all this way to find you. So what sense does the resurrection make? A lot, if you ask me. I don't know if I said anything that, that you haven't heard there before or maybe challenged a couple of preconceived notions that you had, but I'm hoping at least that will cause you to rethink this resurrection, maybe take a second look at it. But in saying all of that, <clears throat> it's not enough to believe in the resurrection as just a naked historical event. So let me shift gears here and get to the second part of our teaching. This one's going to be quicker, but now let me ask the question, what difference does the resurrection make? Fine. Maybe it happened, but what difference does it actually make in your and my life personally? In my experience as a pastor, what I found is that most people outside of Christianity, this is my experience, most people outside of Christianity are not angry about it. They're simply indifferent toward it. Most of the people that I've talked to outside the faith have a mindset that says, hey, I get how that helps some people. I get how parts of that could, could maybe even be good for society, I just don't see how it could possibly be relevant for my life. So, so, so let me go there. What difference does the resurrection make if it's true? <clears throat> I'm going to offer you two answers to that question, uh, and those two answers are going to be our final two ideas during our time together. Number one, here's what difference it makes. The resurrection frees you from yourself. <clears throat> Have you ever asked yourself the question why the resurrection did more than just impress Jesus' followers. I mean, it's not like Jesus stuck around to hang out with them for very long. Um, I, I wonder if you've ever asked the question, why did it make them happy that Jesus came back from the dead? You know, why did it make them, and we have so many extra biblical historical documents that confirm this, why is it that when people go on to believe in the resurrection, it seems to make them happy, it makes them kind, it makes them courageous. I'm certainly not saying all Christians are known for this. We have a lot to own up, you know, for on, on, on our end. But at least these first followers of Jesus, the resurrection didn't just impress them, it caused them to live these sacrificial lives of love and service, even for people that were hurting them. Why is that? <clears throat> the, the answer to that question is that they understood that the resurrection was not just a naked display of power. It wasn't like Jesus' cosmic way of saying, I told you I was God. You didn't believe me. You tried to kill me. Well, I'm back kind of thing. Uh, Paul, in, in Romans chapter 24, verse uh, chapter 4, there's not 24 verses in Romans. In Romans chapter 4, verse 25, Paul explains the personal significance that the resurrection has for you and I. When he says in chapter 4, verse 25, that Jesus was raised for our justification. He says Jesus was delivered up for our sins, but he was raised for our justification. <clears throat> That's a kind of scary sounding religious word, but I, I'm going to read you the definition of the Greek word in the Bible that's translated justify. And I, before I do, I want to make a bold claim. I believe that every single person who listens to this teaching your entire life, whether you realize it or not, you have been trying to justify yourself. And I think, and, and I've been doing the same thing, and I think that, to a greater degree than we realize, has ruined our lives. Here's what it means to justify someone. To show one to be such as he wishes himself to be considered and to declare one to be as he ought to be. When you, so when you justify someone, when, when Scripture says Jesus was raised for our justification, to justify someone means that you're showing them to be what they themselves really want to be. You're showing them to be what they want to be seen as, and you're declaring them to be what they ought to be. In other words, you're saying to that person, you're enough. You have nothing to prove. You have nothing to hide. You have nothing to earn. You are enough. 
There's a world of difference between forgiveness and justification. To be forgiven means you're free to go. To be justified means you're free to come home. Now, there's one reason that God tells us in Scripture that Jesus justifies us through his resurrection, and it's because God knows how much your and my heart needs to hear that. The Bible teaches that when sin entered the world, the very first effect of sin was shame. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. It is the first felt effect of of sin. Just before sin entered the world, this is the last verse of Genesis chapter 2, we're told that the man and the woman were naked and unashamed. That means that that man and that woman experienced a reality that you have never known in your entire life. Adam and Eve, at the end of Genesis chapter 2, they knew what it was like to have nothing to prove and nothing to hide. Naked and unashamed means there there were no need for defenses. There were no need for barriers. It was complete vulnerability, complete openness, complete transparency in every, every possible way. The moment that sin entered the world, the man and the woman experienced shame, and so they sewed fig leaves together to try to cover themselves. And what that story is meant to show you and I about, about us is that ever since sin entered the world, the human heart has had this desperate need to cover itself. The human heart has a desperate need to hide. And the, the only difference, we all hide behind fig leaves, the only difference is what the fig le- leaves look like. We don't want anybody to see into our lives because we know that if people could see deeply into our lives, then, of course, they'd see things that we're ashamed of. So every single one of us does the same thing Adam and Eve did all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. We try to sew fig leaves together and hide ourselves and cover ourselves. It's just a question of what those fig leaves look like. Right? Some people hide behind their careers, meaning you, know, you kill yourself on the job. You sacrifice everything else that matters in life for the sake of that job with this deep-seated belief that maybe if I just achieve, maybe if I just get to this level, maybe if I just succeed, then, then I'll feel like I'm finally enough. Some people hide behind their money believing that if they can just afford a certain lifestyle, that then I'll finally feel like I'm a success, like I'm a worthwhile person. Some people hide behind other people, believing if I can just get the right person to love me, maybe that love will heal me, will fill, fill, this, fill this void that I have. Some people hide behind their own morality. Some people hide behind a substance. But the point is, and this is, I've heard it said before, that history is just a long, sad story of people trying to make themselves happy outside of God. What the Bible's telling us from cover to cover is that no matter... No matter what we achieve in our careers, no matter how many relationships we cycle through, no matter how much money we make, no matter how good we try to be, no matter how much we try to distract and medicate ourselves, what we all eventually realize is the same thing that Adam and Eve realized that day in the garden, that our fig leaves don't work. Now, I want to read you something from a theologian you've never heard of before. His name's Brad Pitt. This 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 came from a 1999 Rolling Stone. That joke always kills every single time. It's like I just, I can count on it. You know, if I got to lift us. All right, here it is. I found this years ago. This is from Brad Pitt being interviewed in uh, Rolling Stone. He said, man, I know all these things are supposed to seem important to us. The car, the condo, our version of success. But if that's the case, why is the general feeling out there reflecting more impotence and isolation and desperation and loneliness? If you ask me, I say toss all this. We got to find something else. Because all I know is that at this point in time, we're heading for a dead end, a numbing of the soul, a complete atrophy of the spiritual being, and I don't want that. The interviewer, who I'm assuming almost fell out of their chair at this point, then asked Sir Pitt, uh, well, then what's the answer to that problem? Here's what he said. Hey, man, I don't have those answers yet. The emphasis now is on success and personal gain. I'm sitting in it, and I'm telling you that's not it. I'm the guy who's got everything, I know, but I'm telling you, and listen to this. This is the one statement I wanted you to hear. He says, I'm telling you, once you get everything, then you're just left with yourself. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. It doesn't help you sleep any better, and you don't wake up any better because of it. Now, no one's going to want to hear that. I understand it. I'm sorry. I'm the guy who's got to say it, but I'm telling you. One more time. Once you get everything, then you're just left with yourself. That, all that is, that's Brad Pitt in his own words. He's putting into, um, in a culturally relevant way, he's putting into words what the Bible says every single one of us knows deep within our inner being. That no matter what we achieve, no matter what relationships we get into, no matter how many filters we throw up on our selfies on Instagram, whatever it is, we know we can't justify ourselves. 
We, we can't get rid of this nagging sense that we're not measure up, that we, that, that we don't measure up, that we're not in, in, adequate, that we can't pass scrutiny, that all this kind of, all of that is what makes the promise of the resurrection so amazing because the resurrection says you can escape that way of life knowing that God himself has covered you because Jesus Christ, through his life, death, and resurrection, justifies you. Now, I, I, I want you to consider for a moment how amazing it is that the man that God gave us that promise through, Romans chapter 4, verse 25, was a man like Paul. Because if you know anything about Paul's story, you know that before he gave his life to Jesus, he murdered people. He leveraged violence against people in the name of God. Now, what that means, and, and this is actually something that I love about Paul. That's the guy that God gave us 13 letters of the New Testament through. Here's what that means. Even after Paul gave his life to Jesus... Paul had done irreparable damage. In other words, Paul had done things that he could not undo. And here's what I think. I think that today, Easter Sunday, there's people listening to me right now who feel exactly like Paul did. You feel like you have done things that you cannot undo. Damage that cannot be undone. Decisions that cannot be unmade. And I'll tell you, you're exactly right. You cannot undo what you have done. But the promises of the gospel is that Jesus Christ can. Jesus Christ can do something for you that no person, no pill, no pay raise will ever be able to do for you. Jesus Christ will justify you. He will make you right with God. He will settle your account with the one person, the only person whose opinion of you ultimately matters. And as that becomes real to your heart, that will lead not just to spiritual freedom, but to psychological freedom, unlike anything else in this world. So that's all theories and concepts. If I can just get a little bit honest with you on a Sunday morning, a little bit about me. I'm, a, I'm actually a twin, but I'm a firstborn. Only beat my brother by a minute, but I've held that over his head his entire life. Plenty to continue to do so. I'm a firstborn. Uh, if you know Myers-Briggs, I'm an INFJ. If you're an Enneagram fan, I'm an Enneagram one. I'm a perfectionist. Here's what all those four things mean. I'm crazy. <laughs> and I've been to a counselor who's told me it. Uh, what all four of those things mean when you put them together is my whole life, I have been incredibly hard on myself. And I have heard that everywhere I've gone. Uh, in grade school, I heard that. In the fire academy, instructors that never met me before pulled me aside and told me that. Literally somebody from this church told me that this week. I, I've never, I'm not kidding, it's not a joke. I wouldn't, it's Easter Sunday. I wouldn't lie today, all right? Maybe the other 51, not today. Um, I've never had trouble seeing the areas of my life where I don't measure up. You know, I, I've, I, there's not a sermon I've preached where I've thought, ah, I could have gone through point two better or whatever. Uh, that, you know, the church would be better if I was a better leader. My family would be better if I was a better husband and father. That's the game I've played my whole life. And I'll tell you this, it is comforting to me. It is encouraging to me when the people God's placed in my life speak life to me and say, Ryan, you're not that bad a guy. That means a lot to me, especially when it from, comes from somebody that I greatly admire. But I will tell you this, church, there is nothing that heals me. There is nothing that carries me. There is nothing that makes me whole, like being able to go back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, knowing that regardless of how I feel, how I perform, or how many times I fail, my account has been settled before God, not because of anything that I've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And maybe you hear that and you think, oh, so if I just give my life to Jesus, I never have to face myself. No, no, no. What I'm saying is until you give your life to Jesus, you'll never be able to face yourself. The only thing that enables me to look my wife in the, in the eye and apologize when I've failed her as her husband or my children as their father or you all as my church, the only thing that gives me the psychological footing to face my life to face the areas of weakness in me, to listen to criticism, and to actually repent and apologize is knowing that Jesus Christ has already settled my account. Now I have the ability to go and, and, and live this life of repentance, which is the only way to become this person of greatness, of, of character, of strength, of humility that God desires every one of us to be. So first and foremost, the resurrection frees us from ourselves. It frees us to face ourselves. But secondly, and lastly, and I do mean lastly, the resurrection frees you from this whole daggone world. 1 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 15, which is the premier, I think it's the, the most important chapter in the Bible, my opinion, as far as explaining the event of the resurrection and its implications, we're told that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a first fruit. It's the Bible's way of telling us that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a, it, it's, it's a type 
It's the kind of resurrection that every one of Jesus' followers and, and all of creation will one day experience. In other words, if you want to know what kind of resurrection you're going to have in Jesus, look at Jesus' resurrection. Now, here's what we know about Jesus' resurrection. He was not raised as an intangible, translucent spirit. He was raised in a physical body. He recognized his friends. His friends, although they had trouble at first, they recognized him. He was able to sit with them. He was able to embrace them. He was able to share a meal with them. The difference is Jesus' body was completely perfect forever. It was, it was freed from death and would never be subject to the power of death or the power of decay ever again. The Bible says Jesus' uh, uh, resurrection, it's a first fruit, meaning your resurrection in him will be like that. That message that is, that is ultimately what changed the lives of those first followers of Jesus and has enabled Christians to face the most difficult times of life for the last 2,000 years. To explain what I mean, let me ask you a question. And that, now we're going to get real. Why is it so hard for us to face death? Of course, death is hard. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard for us to face loss, to face disappointment, to face failure? Let, let me offer an answer to that question. It's because the fear that we have underneath every other fear that we have is that this, li this life is the only life we're ever going to have. This money is the only money we're ever going to have. These opportunities are, are the only opportunities we're ever going to have. These relationships, this body, this world, this life, this is all we're ever going to have. The resurrection of Jesus Christ looks you dead in the eye and says, you're wrong. Jesus Christ, through the resurrection, offers you something that no other belief system in history has ever dared to offer because the resurrection is not just a consolation, it's a restoration. Here's what I mean by that. Most of my life, even born and raised in the church, most of my life, I, I've sort of thought of heaven as this place where, you know, God welcomes you in and, and basically says, hey, I'm, you know, I'm so sorry about how hard your life was. You had to see people you love die. A lot, a lot of times your plans didn't really work out the way that you wanted to. You cried a lot of tears. But here's heaven, you know. You can float around on a cloud for a couple trillion years. We got streets of gold. The scenery's great. Just try to have a nice time. All that is is a consolation. That's just a consolation for the life that you lost. Jesus Christ, through the resurrection, is offering you a whole lot more than that. That's what, that's what a lot of other belief systems offer. But what, what the resurrection offers, we are promised that God, one day, will restore this entire world, all of creation, to the way that it was before the fall. He's going to entirely remove evil and injustice and suffering and decay and sin. It's going to be perfect. And in that creation, he will give people who've given their lives to Jesus resurrected bodies bodies completely free from the corrupting power of sin and death to enjoy that creation forever. Here's what that means. And while I explain this, I want to call the worship team up and everybody who's involved with baptisms, you can get moving now. Picture the times in your life when you have been the happiest, when you've been the most fulfilled, when you felt the most alive. What the Bible is saying is that even those moments fall infinitely short of what every moment of your existence is going to be like in the resurrection. Because it's not a consolation of the life that you've lost. It's the restoration of the life that you've always wanted. C.S. Lewis has this great quote. He talks about this longing. He says, Our longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we now feel cut off. To be on the inside of some door which we've always seen from the outside. He says, That's no mere neurotic fantasy. It's the truest index of our real situation. He's saying all of your life you have felt disconnected from something you're meant to be united with. And all of your life you felt like you've been standing on the outside of a door that you were meant to walk through. The resurrection is the promise that one day you're going to walk through that door and you're going to be reunited. You're going to be reconnected totally, fully, eternally. That means that you will get the body that you always wanted but never had. You'll get the relationships that you always wanted but never had. You'll get the life that you always wanted and never had. Can you, can you please think about the hope that that offers people with physical disabilities? Can you think about the hope that that offers people who've suffered with mental illness? Can you think about the hope that offers people like so many of you have who have experienced real pain, real tragedy, real sorrow, real suffering, the hope that that offers people who come to the realization that no matter how good my life is, it's never going to be good enough to satisfy my soul. The resurrection of Jesus Christ says that in the end, you will not miss out on anything because what's ahead of you in Jesus is not just a consolation for what you've lost. It's a restoration of what you've always longed for. So we're done here. I would just ask you this morning, do you know what you have in Jesus? 
do you know what do you know what Easter really means? It means that Jesus has been raised for you, and you, by simply believing in him, can be raised with him. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what God has for you tomorrow, but I do know that it's nothing that a resurrection cannot cure. And you can begin to experience the power of the resurrection by grace through faith in the name of Jesus today. So church, I'd ask you as we close, would you stand with me? We got a couple of people who are going forward, uh, publicly declaring the fact that they have put their trust in the resurrected Son of God, Jesus Christ. Sarah's going to lead us out in one final song, and I'd ask as we do this, let's cheer for our brothers and sisters that are going public with their faith. Let's worship the God who raises people to life. That's it. That's all. Happy Easter. was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a My heart grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. Death was arrested, if I might be
goodness. Thank you so much um, to everybody who shared their testimony, to everybody who went forward in, in baptism. You lit this place on fire, the worship team, and, and, and all of you for choosing to spend Easter with us. Last thing here, if this is your first time with us, please don't let it be your last time. When you look at the accounts of the people that experienced the resurrection, the message of Easter, it was never a one-off for them. It was the beginning of an adventure in which for the rest of their lives, they were continually being transformed as they experienced God in newer, deeper, more life-changing ways. And starting seven days from now, we're going to be um, starting a series that answers that exact question. How do you have an encounter with God that can actually change your life? If that's something that interests you, we're going to be right here seven days from now, 9 and 11 a.m. We'll save a seat for you. Love you. Have the greatest Easter ever.